questions have come. Matilda and others. Elizabeth Cady Stanton. I'm afraid of so many things that have been misinterpreted about the long journey for women's suffrage, but someday they will find themselves living down some errors I have made. But as a child, I never feared that. I think it's my older age that's bringing that on. I just turned 65. And I find, I see things a little differently. My childhood was somewhat tumultuous, but full of joy. My father was a strict Quaker. And my mother was a rather beautiful Baptist girl. They met in school because the farms that they lived on were neighbors up in Adams. You know where Adams, Massachusetts is? Lovely Berkshires. Lots of health and running outdoors and growing things. And we just, we all supported each other as one by one more children were born. I was the second one. And I found that in spite of my mother having to marry into the Quakers, she maintained her good nature, although she no longer was permitted to sing. Yes, they were very strict, those Quakers. And I found that when I finally escaped at boarding school, I was relieved. But that strict business of being faithful and having that inner light within me that my father instilled in all of us made me strong. Yes, made me strong. I could not be who I am without that Quaker beginning. After about nine or 10 years, we found that it was a great idea to accept a local judge's idea to finance our mill business and to move. But before we did, I was still in elementary school and I came home bawling and raging because the teacher said, I was a woman, I was a girl, and I was not permitted to learn long division. Imagine that. Well, I said, I'm not going anymore to that school. And my father said, let's start a school here. So not only did he have a school for me and my sisters and brothers, but all the mill workers who were at our mill were teenage girls, and that's what's the custom in those days. The teenage girls learned to read and write. And my mother became very careworn cooking for this large crew and making clothes and sewing. It was a lot, and I feared for her careworn looks that developed over these years. But at last, we got financing from a local judge, and. We moved 45 miles away to a rather posh area on the Batten Kill that put us in New York State. Bye bye, Berkshires. And there we settled for some time and had very successful mills. My father was a great businessman. And although it pricked his conscience quite a bit that that cotton had come from the South where slaves had picked the cotton that would then be woven into cloth in our mills. He knew at least that the economic feature of it did not mean that he was part of beating or be abusing, as was the custom somewhat in the South that we heard later on. So our, far our farm days were over, our mill days were thriving, and we had a wonderful series of years and my older sister, Guelma, who was only 17 months older than me, went off to boarding school. And there she learned all kinds of arithmetic and division. And all of a sudden, there was a setback. Money was tight. Suddenly, you know that President Jackson, do you recall this guy? He thought he could just represent the common man. 
And he closed up the federal banks and said, let's just give all the cash to the state banks and let them run things for a while. Well, of course, the state banks didn't know anything about what to do with finances and how to dole out loans. They just handed it out to willy-nilly until runs on the bank occurred and farmers lost their land and businesses folded. When that happened, my father had just let me go to the same boarding school and I was enjoying meeting people that came to lecture. For example, Lucretia Mott came to our school and spoke of women's rights. Wow, was that in tune with thou and thine. I could abandon that language. And that's how I've been raised anyway, from my very fine parents and family. And after she had left, my father came heartbroken to the school. You know, it was quite a distance from where we lived. To get there, he'd have to, as we had in the beginning, go all the way up to Albany and hop up, ooh, a beautiful boat, a steamboat, all the way down to Pennsylvania, where we were going to boarding school. So I agreed to go home after the semester. Guelma got to stay another year teaching because she was older than I. So once I got home, I fell into the routine of, well, what shall we do now? Well, we'll move to a less expensive and less posh area and we'll continue with one of our old grist mills. And again, hard labor showed on my mother's face and my father's disappointment in the economics. But nonetheless, we were a team and we were with each other for all the years that we had. Now, there were dancing, there were parties. We were allowed to attend because, remember, my mother never signed up to be a Quaker. Nah. She obeyed and wasn't happy, but she loved my father and that's why she married him. So I got to attend these dances too and be kind of a chaperone. Mom told me I was the, I was the dragon. I could drag them out of there when they got into trouble or if they stayed too late at the fair. <laughs> After many years, I realized that Partying and boyfriends was not for me, although I was found quite attractive. You may not know that. Those of you that have seen me today, I am, I am quite the figure. I've stayed very healthy through my years, constant walking and constant doing and see my ancestors on the wall. We're all slender and strong. We don't get fat or slothful waited on. In fact, I discovered that for a young woman, you had two options. You would either marry or you would be a spinster. And if you were a spinster, you lived with relatives who had to take care of you. That was not for me. Or you could be a teacher. So I became a teacher. And there were suitors. There were indeed suitors. Men don't shy away from somebody who is trim, reasonably attractive, even though one of my eyes is constantly crossing. You want to know why? Well, back when we were changing dwellings because of the, the panic and the loss of funds, I got to stay with my grandma and grandpa, and they were not the Quaker ones. They were the ones who introduced me to reading. At four years old, I could read. And during this time, I was ill. And we didn't know that reading, you know, when you had mumps or measles and so on in those days, could affect your eyes. So I came home cross-eyed as a loon. Eventually, one eye got stronger and stopped crossing, but the other one always seemed to wander so that's why I always have my portrait as a profile. In fact, I really had to wear glasses to try to keep my eyes straight. I'm amazed they'd stayed straight this long. Here we are.
we go. Oh, there you are, all my friends. I'm going to sing you a song which was made famous through the incredibly beautiful strength of this woman. She had been raised a slave in Ulster County, but she managed to buy her freedom through her labor and her strength and her convictions. And she went on to be a very good activist, a powerful activist. And in later years, we even traveled together and she was my friend. She had been a slave, but she became an incredibly powerful, independent black woman. So here's a ballad that I will play on my somewhat modern guitar. And it is Sojourner's Truth singing, I'm pleading for my people. I'm pleading for my people to have their rights restored for they have long been toiling and have yet to find reward. They are forced the crops to culture, but not for them they yield. Although, but late and early, they labor in the field. While I bear upon my body the scars of many a lash, I'm pleading for my people who groan beneath the lash. I am pleading for the mothers who gaze in wild despair to see the hated auction block with their love and beauteous children there. I became aware of slavery, much as many people do, through rumors, through newspapers, through all of the information. And I didn't like it. And I was really ready to do more than teach at a boarding school. Our, our farm was on the outskirts of Rochester by this time, and we had given up the mill business completely. In 1845, as a matter of fact, we became associated with a group of Quakers who lived in the Rochester area, and religions began to blend a little bit through politics and spiritual aims not necessarily t staying strictly in one or another. In fact, we were nicknamed the Congregational Quakers. And what we did was have meetings open to all. And finally, I met the, the amazing activist, Frederick Douglass, who lived there. He lived right in the Rochester area. And as my brothers grew older, they went off to work for the cause of freedom from slavery. My brothers moved to California and started newspapers out that way. And they were part of bloody Kansas and, and the border war that went on because Kansas was right on the border there and they didn't want to rep have uh, especially in Leavenworth area, they did not want to have slaves as part of their territory. And I had a sister, Mary. She became a headmistress at a boarding school, and she was able to demand equal pay. Now, I could tell you for hours how that went. First of all, most women stayed in the home, as they were told. They were not allowed out. Most women raised lots of children. The man could come home 
and have sex anytime he wanted for any reason. Most women were accepting of this. They didn't really care to have equal rights. In fact, even the vote didn't please them as a goal. So we had a lot of work cut out for us when we thought of doing that kind of activity among us. And in fact, not only was my sister a principal, but she got equal pay. So if you have a job, if you're lucky enough to have a teaching job that pays, it's at least a third less than the men teachers. In fact, as the years passed, I started hiking about the country. Sometimes I tra I even traveled alone most of the time. One winter, I was in stage little carriage and on foot through an icy, icy, icy season. And I would come to the door and I would bring the news of being an abolitionist. And I would bring the news of being a temperist, temper for temperance. <laughs> Forgive my stuttering. I get so enthusiastic. You know, it's hard to know how much I care about my work until I start talking about it. I look very severe, but I usually stay very still and meditate. I don't get distracted by what's around me. I keep my focus entirely on my work. This is what is unique about me. I'm not a social lady. In fact, I don't consider myself a lady at all. I think all of that is hogwash. Nonetheless, I respect all women and their choices. So that when, in 1848, a few years later, we heard about a gathering that my sisters and my father attended, not the first one in 1848, but the second one. And they signed a Declaration of Sentiments. What was that? Well, there was a writer, and her name was Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Became my best friend. She grew up wealthy, and she had the choice of marrying and becoming what we call a doll. You see, in those days, if you were a doll, you married wealthy, and you were pampered and waited on hand and foot. But I digress. I want to get back to another hymn before I go off on another tangent. You see, I really prefer singing these songs in order that they come, but I tend to forget where the order is. And this one that I'm going to sing for you now is describing how conditions were for the other quality of women, which we're called drudge. Women were called a drudge. If they married poor, then they had a lifelong obligation to raise children and wait on the husband. And if they got an outside job, all, her, let's say I'm her, all my earnings go to my husband, every dime. In fact, let me get back to this song in a minute. When I toured, either alone or with a friend, a, a fellow woman, we stayed in inns along the way. We would come in out of the cold and we would warm our feet by the fire. And there, a careworn woman who had several children batting around the house would have to stop everything, prepare us a meal, heat up the room, and then go back to all her labors. Every penny that she did for all that work for a roadside inn or a local tavern that took in boarders, all was given to her husband. And some of those husbands were bums. Yes, outward drunkards. And that's why I am so against alcohol. You know, I know people, Susan Cady Stanton's 
people. They would drink wine and celebrate and everything was fine. But in the poorer realm, women had a sphere that they stayed in and belonged in and were not allowed to progress from unless they were very determined and very fortunate. So let me tell you a, a, a little tale. Stephen Foster is one of the most popular writers of our time. He wrote very joyful songs like, Oh, Susanna, oh, don't you cry for me, cause I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. Oh, Susanna, don't you cry for me, cause I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. Well, that was fun. And it was very popular, but his life was not so easy. He wrote Hard Times, which is one of my favorites. As we pause in life's pleasure and count its many years, let us all some sorrow with the poor. It's a song that will linger forever in our ears. Oh, hard times come again no more. It's a song, the sigh of the weary. Hard times, hard times come again no more. Many times I linger outside the cabin door. Oh, hard times come again no more. As we seek mirth and beauty and music white and gay, there are faint forms fainting at the door. Though their voices are silent, their pleading looks will say, oh, hard times come again no more. It's a song, a sigh of a weary hard times, hard times come again no more many days you will linger outside the cabin door oh hard times come again no more it's a song that the wind blows on the troubled wave it's a cry that's heard along the shore it's the words that are whispered Beside the lowly grave, oh, hard times come again no more. It's a song to sigh of the weary. Hard times, hard times come again no more. Many days you have lingered outside my cabin door, oh times come again no more oh hard times come again no more stephen foster and those were the drudges that he would see the poor women fainting i might make a note here one of the reasons women in our my era were known to faint so much is because those darn corsets were so tight they could barely breathe. Did you know that? And I do not wear a corset, would never wear a corset. My figure is not that important to me. I am blessed with a healthy back body. In fact, I have more stamina even now at 65, than any person I know at 45. It's just, I'm not really a religious person, but I, I have this inner light that I mentioned earlier from the Quaker childhood. And that inner light guides me to know that this is what I'm supposed to do. And the only way to do it is to stay fit. So cross-eyed or no cross-eyed, I'm on board. Well, anyway, I get carried away. Let me go on to another song before I wear you out with my talking. 
You know, I did meet abolitionists and Frederick Douglass and all of the people who were so important in the abolitionist movement as I traveled. And the lecture service circuit did pay a little bit so that I was able to keep going. I used my teacher savings for a while, but once all the funds ran out, I had to charge at the door. And I wondered why women didn't contribute more than they did. They didn't have any money. As I explained earlier, all their earnings went to their husbands, drunken bums or kindly men. In fact, I recall that when I was working in my father's mill, yes, for a few weeks there was a, a co-worker. She was brilliant and she was sick for a few days, actually two weeks. And my sister and I tossed a coin to see who would get to take her place. And my father let me take her place. And I went to him afterwards and he said, you know, every time the loom would break down, dad, this woman would come along and fix it. The man overseer didn't have a clue how to do that. Why don't you make her the overseer, the kind and brilliant leader in this job? And even my father said, oh, it would never, never do to have a woman be the boss. So even at home. I experienced it. Hope you don't mind me jumping around so much, but it's, I haven't had a chat. You know, I mean, a chat and tea, and let me get some water here. I'm running out of steam just because at the end of our time together, you're happy, welcome to ask me questions. I can see one of you bopping along to my songs. How lovely you are. And I see some others grinning because actually I have some suffragists in the audience. Yes, very famous suffragists come to hear me speak and I go to follow their work as well. So the song I'd like to do now is called Mary Brown Abolitionist. Uh, well, actually, that song was written by a pal of mine and I'll just have to invite you another time when some of these friends of mine, these songwriters are available. I see people nodding their head. Yeah, let's get these Matilda Gage and all these, you know, we need all these people in here to sing these songs with you, Lydia. Well, I will do that. This song was written um, really just called upon people to remember songs they grew up with. Because there were no recordings and we just had to use tunes with new words. That's how we did it. John Brown's body moldering in the grave. John Brown's body was a rolling in the grave. John Brown's body was a moldering in the grave. He fought for rights of all. John Brown died on a scaffold of the slave. John Brown died on a scaffold for the slave. John Brown died on the scaffold for the grave. Dark was the hour when we dug his gravel grave. We Freedom, freedom, glorious freedom reigns. John Brown's soul through the world is passing on. Hail to the hour when oppression shall be gone. All men will sing in the better ages dawn. Freedom rules today. We get good name. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Freedom reigns today. Thank 
you so much. It is wonderful and not surprising there are no men in this audience. Although there are a few men that do come along and stick along. In fact, it's years later that the abolitionists showed their true colors and they decided not to back women's rights for vote later on because they wanted to maintain their goal is to first of all rid our nation of slavery and get to the Emancipation Proclamation that later came and the 13th and 14th Amendment which freed the slaves forever. It was not important enough to them to include women in that proclamation because they felt that it would distract and possibly ruin the chances of getting this freedom for slaves forever in our government, in our constitution. I don't agree. In fact, there were lots of disagreements that came on uh, through our efforts, uh, me and many other women and a few men. But even, you know, even Frederick, my dearest friend from Rochester, Frederick Douglass came to disagree with the scope of what we were after. He didn't realize that equal rights would mean that women would be supportive and moving everyone forward in the same cause, as well as being the right thing to do. I did tell you I was a teacher, well, at one teacher's convention, it was unbelievable. I arrived there and all these men are lolling around and patting themselves on the back. And I think it was about 1853, I think. And these men were saying, all right, women, you don't get to speak here. Only men can be on the stage. In fact, when Elizabeth Cady and her new husband sailed for Europe to an anti-slavery convention from all over the world, they weren't, she wasn't allowed to be on stage. They had to stay behind a curtain. It just wasn't done. And because it wasn't done, we wasted a lot of years traipsing around the country, raising money and trying to convince people that it should not be so. But I digress as usual. This convention, this teacher's convention was up near Albany, I believe. And to think that all these women were present but couldn't speak and all these men spoke. In fact, somebody did take the time to ask me, why are you marching up to the stage and demanding to be speaking here? And I said, because women should be speaking on the stage. We're teachers, but men are here to discuss their low wages. We don't like getting low pay. I said, well, why do you get low pay? Because women are paid even lower. And if they can get away with teachers at a third of what they pay men, why should they increase your salary? Do the math. It helps everyone. I'm not going to say I digress because I've said that so many times, but you know, I'm proud of my life and I am going to sing a suffrage song now because what happened well, this is, a, this is a comical one that I shared with my friends. We had so much fun doing shows at the libraries. And we are speaking on our lecture tours. And we are dressing up in our finest dresses. And we are not frightened of any of you. Men tell us to spit that wives should submit to their husbands submissively weakly. Oh, whatever they say, their wife should obey unquestionably. Meekly, our husbands would make their own dictum take without ever a wherefore or why for it. But I don't and I can't 
I won't and I shan't. No, I will speak my mind if I die for it. Well, we know it's all fudge to say man's the best judge of what should be and shouldn't and so on. Or women should bow, not attempt to say how. She considers that matters should go on. I never yet gave myself up as a slave. However, my husband might try for it. But I don't and I can't. I won't and I shan't. I will speak my mind if I die for it. All ladies, I hope, with husbands to cope with the rights of the sex will not trifle. That is all if we choose our tongues but to use. Can all opposition soon stifle? We can. Let man, if he will, bid us be still and silent a price he'll pay. High for it, for we won't and we can't. We don't and we shan't. No, we will all speak our minds if we die for it. Oh, you're so kind. <coughs> I have a little water break here. Take notes, you may have a question. And now we will move on to Wyoming. It turned out that Wyoming was a great territory. And the women out there did all the farming and the horseback riding and all the, in fact, there were more women out there than there were back east because they had to move out there on these wagon trains and they tended to survive. The, they did. They tended to survive longer than their husbands who died of this fever or that fever or some, you know, Indian arrow in their neck. So women were the forerunners, the pioneers. They built homes and you know from your history books how strong they were. So I would like to sing a beautiful ballad by a very close friend of mine. She was Julia Mills Dunn, she was a missionary. Now, as I said, I'm not a Christian in the sense of Bible thumping because too many Christians are hmm, kind of tweaking this movement a little bit and offending some people. It's complicated. And all we have is, well, Katie Stanton and I, we, we did. We did start a newspaper and it was called The Revolution. And we put our, our views on paper. And but I'll get to that, don't let me forget. Let me just sing two cute songs here. I left out this one, it's a real cutie. Oh dear, what can the matter be, dear, dear? What can the matter be, oh dear? What can the matter be? Women are wanting the vote. <laughs> Women have husbands, they are protected. Women have sons by whom they're respected. Women have fathers, so they're not neglected. Why are they wanting the vote? <clears throat> oh dear, what can the matter be, dear, dear? What can the matter be, oh dear? What can the matter be? Women are wanting the vote. Women have homes, there they should labor. Women have children, them they should favor. Women have time to learn of each neighbor. Why are they wanting the vote? Oh dear, what can the matter be? What can no matter be, oh dear? What can no matter be? Women are wanting the vote. Women can dress. They love 
society, women have cash with all its variety. Women can pray with all pious piety. That's why they're wanting the vote. What? Why are they wanting the vote? Because women have reared the sons of the brave. Women have shared in the battles they gave. Women have labored our country to save. That's why we're wanting the vote. That's why we're wanting the vote. Hope to see you soon when you can sing it with me. Clay pots. We always had clay pots around. See my ancestors on the wall behind me? We work together. Actually, they're really not that far distant, just a few years older. And now I will sing the beautiful ballad that my friend wrote. you can hear the guitar well enough. Can you wave at me if you hear it well enough? Thank you, audience. Still no men out there, are there? Well, you've got a lot of work to... Oh! There's one! It's Richard! Oh, Richard! And Pat Lamana! Oh, my goodness! From Wyoming's Rocky Valley to the wild New Hampshire hills, from the northern lakes of silver to the sunny southern rills, though the clarion call of freedom all the listening silence thrills blow the clarion call of freedom all the listening silence thrills we have heard the voice of freedom on that far off western shore we have heard the echoes calling as our fathers heard before. We have singing, stirring music. We are singing equal rights forevermore. Let us sing its stirring music. Equal rights forevermore. We have watched the dawning splendor of a promise in the skies. We have heard with accents tender, lo ye faithful women rise, who would equal just Who would equal justice render? We will never more despise. Thank you so much. And we were proud of Wyoming and the other states that came in, and they came in to vote because. There were two organizations that went back and forth. And I won't bore you with all the details because they're well written down nowadays. I've become quite famous. And the battles that I had for one side or the other, well, I don't click. <laughs> I don't care to discuss them that much. I mean, if you see me later, you can ask me. But the point was that women were distracted by the war. And we were told and persuaded to give up our cause for a time. Now, I do agree 
that that was a terrible time in our history and all attention needed to be to win that war and hopefully bring peace to our land. But as it turned out, those amendments that I referred to earlier, they did take place after the war, the Emancipation Proclamation did occur, but by us being idle, by me being idle in New York State, where I had won a lot of victories, singly handed, were taken away. Women were allowed to own their own property. They had so much more power, but it was snatched away when I wasn't looking. So you must be vigilant, my dears, and you have this condition probably for centuries to come. Do not ask me why. I just know it is so. So after the war, we got back to work and we recognized that the state of Wyoming would not come into the Union as a state unless they brought the right to vote with them. And many of my colleagues went about working for states' rights so that many women could vote in many states. And I thought it would be better to work in Congress and, and I put my energy going to Washington, D.C. and to many conventions. As a matter of fact, I enjoyed fighting. I did. I can't deny it. Not very Quaker of me, is it? My beloved Elizabeth Cady Stanton, she and I drafted some work. Well, actually, she did all the writing. I was the big mouth and the stronger. Do you know that she had seven children to raise? You know, this baby dumb, that's what I call it. This baby dumb is a full time job. Anyway, it wears us out and it accomplishes wonderful things for those children, but women's rights stay the same. So how good is that? Education wise too, but I digress. I do a lot of digressing. You are flattering me by coming in such numbers to this lecture. I'm used to lectures where they throw fruit, they throw bananas, they throw tomatoes at me. In fact, I have been laughed off the stage way back in 1851, as I said, when I just started my career. I said, okay, I'll go along with all these fashion things that make it easier to tromp through the icy snow. I will shorten my skirts. A cousin of Luce, of, of um, a cousin of uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. I've forgotten her first name, but anyway, she was a uh, last name was Bloomer. She designed a short skirt, and you could wear the short skirt over long pants. And I decided to cut my hair. That was my idea. Bob it right here. See, don't I look good with its length? but it's not that late. <laughs> Yours it only lasted a year and I couldn't take it. On the steps of the post office in Washington, DC, as I was saying, I go down there to fight with Congress and get my oar in. And they had so much more interest in mocking me about what I was wearing than listening to what I had to say. So I gave it up because I needed to have people listen to what I had to say. And what Elizabeth Cady Stanton and I did, we brought a thing called the Declarations of Sentiments. And that was on the anniversary of 1776. And we brought that down to Philadelphia where they were having a big convention and they would not let us on the stage or any other women on the stage. We bust ahead. We mo I got up on the stage anyway. Try turning me away. And I started reading this thing and they threw me off the stage that Elizabeth had written. And it was called the De Decorations of Sentiments. And I passed out copy after copy after copy. A thousand copies we passed out so that people would know all we were asking for is one word. male and female. So, no big complicated deal. 
the rights should be self-evident that all men and women, woman, not women, woman, are created equal. That's simple, and it's true. So, I think I should check my timepiece, which doesn't seem to be here. My father gave me a timepiece, and I will tell you that he passed away suddenly. We were so close, and I had gone home to spend some time with him, and uh, just all of a sudden, he had an illness that we didn't understand, and he died. I was heartbroken. That was in 1869. I was heartbroken, and I felt such agony and pain. But I knew that he heartily approved of everything his militant daughter was doing. And for that, I am grateful. So after he died, I got myself together and I was part of a women's, woman's, excuse me, woman's loyal national league. And even the American Equal Rights Association, we advertised about these things in our revolution. And there was a scandal. The scandal was that there was this fellow named, I don't know, I don't even remember his first name. His name was Train. And he was this big, obnoxious character who happened to have been born in, in Massachusetts. Hi, I'm Mr. Train. I will support your magazine. Well, we couldn't find any backers. And I did take him on his offer. You see, what happened was he had been in favor of slavery. And then he quit that when it didn't look like the way to go. And he became hmm, some kind of abolitionist. So I took his money and Miss Katie Stanton and I. Did you know I say Katie Stanton a lot? She was courageous. She took her own name. That was huge. Yeah, she wasn't Mrs. Mrs. Harold Stanton. She was Mrs. Miss Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Anyway, I digress again. You know, I should say here, careful, cautious people always casting about to preserve their reputation and their social standing never can bring about a reform. Those who are really in earnest must be willing to be anything or nothing in the world's estimation, publicly and privately. And persecuted ideas with despicable non-sympathy, we ignore this. We allow our sympathy with the right and their advocates, our advocates and whatever, they bear the consequences. I said that in 1860, before the Civil War, and I printed such things in the Revolution after the Civil War. The Revolution didn't survive. This Mr. Train that everybody despised, well, he actually was a scoundrel. They were right. But I just needed the funds to start up this newspaper. As usual, most of the writing was done by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but there were others. Matilda Gage, for example, there were an awful lot of other people. Lucretia Mott, you know, she wrote stuff too. We have to acknowledge many more suffragists. And by the way, suffragists in England and Europe, they were called, women of our talent and goals were called suffragettes, but not here. In the United States, suffragists. So after all this went down, we lost our funding when Mr. Train decided to go back to Europe, to England, and he was caught stealing something from the mail. So he was a scoundrel, and we never heard from him anymore. People did take up the banner, but I'm talking about myself and what I know deeply but there are many other people that took up the banner. And at last, these two groups that I 
mentioned before, in my latter years, I defied a few opinions and I said, National Women's Suffrage Association and American Women's Suffrage Association, Women's Association should be one because we're only hurting ourselves to be two different groups. Well, I'm sure we need another song in here and I have no idea how long I've been lecturing at you. Ah, sorry, I didn't mean to say at you. Oh, how impolite I was. I'm paging through my music that was sent to me. You know, this is another funny one. Do you want me to sing another funny one? One of you ladies, what? I see you there, Miss Carey. A lot of you women seem to bounce a lot more. And Christine, look at her, so reserved with her beautiful hair. All of you. And all of you out there, with this, this wonderful spread to all of you, thank you. And don't give up the fight. Because, you know, Oberlin finally granted degrees to women, and that's where Elizabeth Cady Stanton got her degree. I never had the ability to get to a college because I certainly couldn't afford it. The ones I could afford were only for men. So I will sing another few more songs because my intelligent people out there probably would like to see it. So let me, uh, let me stop looking at my friends in the audience. There must be an enemy out there. Look at Regina, how dignified you look. And all of you out there that can see me talking to my audience here, gathered around at my feet, Tis I that's never had a friendly audience in my life. Here it is. Congratulations to you all for being almost as smart as I am. Oh, I'm not exactly humble, even though I was raised that way. So here's a really cute one. <clears throat> Oh, he is not the man for me who buys and sells a slave. Oh, he is one to set him free and sends him to his grave. But he whose noble heart beats true for all men's lives and liberty. Oh, that's the man for me, aha, that's the man for me. Oh, he's not at all the man for me who sells a man for gain and bends a pliant servile knee to slavery's god of shame. But he whose godlike form erect proclaims that all alike are free. Oh, that's the man for me, aha, and that's the man for me. Well, you know, it goes on like that. But as we come to the end of the century, we're finding more music that is written pretty much for the woman and saying what women today, women today can do as a woman of honor. And I am so happy that these women have been sending me songs. I mean, for example, just the most beautiful song came by post and it goes like this. It was written by an elder. She's not really an elder. She's just a free woman. Because when you're an elder, it says pretty much that you're a Quaker. And though I totally respect my Quaker background, and all Quaker women were raised equal. We still experience job discrimination and barriers from any possible level of society. So let me just sing this little song for you. I am a woman here on planet Earth. I have the breath of life in me, a gift given at birth, no one, nobody 
no powers that be can ever, ever, ever take this gift away from me. I am a woman here on planet Earth. I have the song to sing in me, a song sung birth to birth. No one, nobody, nobody, no powers that be can ever, ever, ever take that gift away from me. I am a woman here on planet Earth. I have the gift of love in me, a love in me at birth. No one, nobody, no one, can never be that takes the gift of love in me. I'm given at my birth. I am a woman here on planet Earth. I have the will to live in me, a gift given at birth. No one, nobody, no power that be shall ever, ever, ever take the will to live, the will to change, the will of equality from me. Yes, glory, glory, hallelujah. Thank you so much for coming to my little survey of my life. I have enjoyed your presence and I have enjoyed so much that you, you women, continue the journey to equality, to selflessness, not selfishness, but never allowing yourself to be diminished by men or factory or doctors, lawyers. You have embraced those professions for yourself and you have won equal rights in everything you do. So congratulations to you. I do have many more songs and I would love to be invited back with, I mentioned Charlene Leahy, who wrote a song about very strong women too. And Pat Bamana, who writes about very strong women and men. And I'm so grateful for your time because I know there's many of you poets out there I am very honored to be in your presence. Thank you. <laughs>